this is not like her, something's wrong. There would have been someone that would have known where she was. She wouldn't have just completely disappeared off the face of the earth. The suitcase effectively pops open and then out comes a torso. It is certainly the most gruesome story I've ever covered as a reporter. The murder of Gemma McCluskey was a crime that shook Britain. In early March 2012, a young woman goes missing in East London. She's 29-year-old actress Gemma McCluskey, familiar to millions, having starred in the TV drama series EastEnders. I got a phone call off Tony uh, to say that uh, he hadn't seen her for a couple of days. Gemma shares a home with her brother, Tony, and their mum whilst also enjoying a close relationship with her father, Anthony, and elder brother, Danny. As someone who's never out of touch for long, this is out of character, and her family and friends start to worry. One of our mutual friends, Jade, messaged me on Facebook and asked me if I'd seen Jem. I responded um, and just said, like, no, I haven't seen her. And um, why, what's up? And she said, oh, she's, she's gone missing. No one's seen or heard from her for a couple of days. As well as having a close family, Gemma was also part of a large and tight-knit group of friends, many of whom quickly realised that something isn't quite right. A lot of people had obviously called her phone, messaged her phone, and she'd not got back to anyone. Growing increasingly concerned, Gemma's family desperately tried to find any trace of her. Well, she was working in a club in Kingsland Road. Danny had gone round the club and spoke to the manager, and they said, they hadn't seen her for a couple of days. She was supposed to be at work, the manager said, but she hadn't turned up. And no one could contact her. They'd been ringing her, but couldn't get hold of her on the phone. Gemma's lack of contact is troubling, especially as her loved ones are aware that there have been some problems in the McCluskey house for quite some time, largely because of her brother Tony's growing addiction to a strong strain of cannabis known as skunk. Gemma and her mother Pauline had been telling me that he'd been smoking uh, the skunk in the house and there'd been a lot of arguing going on. And they told him if he didn't stop smoking, he wanted him out. Mainly the arguments were when Pauline was in hospital, because obviously then Gemma had a greater sense of, you know, I have to keep this tidy for mum, I have to do mum's role. So I think she felt the pressure and that led to sort of quite explosive arguments with him at times. Knowing that Tony and his sister had been rowing a lot recently, Gemma's father naturally wonders if it's happened again. I said to Tony, have you and Gemma had an argument? He said, I'll be honest with you, what happened was, I fell asleep after running a bath and it flooded through into the hallway. I said, OK. I said, well, that's not a problem, is it? With their mother suffering from a serious illness and Gemma, her main carer, it's unusual for her to simply disappear. Gemma's friends, many of whom are aware of the tempestuous and sometimes violent relationship between her and her brother, are becoming increasingly worried. I thought, oh, maybe they've had like a really bad argument. He's beat her up or something and she's just run away from the situation. But she loved her mum um, and as much as, even, like even, like, I thought she'd gone for a break, but there would have been someone that would have known where she was because she was the sole carer. She wouldn't have just completely disappeared off the face of the earth. I spoke to Tony within the next like sort of few days. I kept calling him, letting him know that you know I was going out looking. Printed out some flyers and put them up. Asked people. Did quite a lot on social media. Then I continued to talk to Tony on the phone, and he assured me like, "Don't worry, girl, she'll be all right." He calmed me on a number of times when I phoned him. And I was like, oh, if her brother thinks she's going to be all right, she'll be all right, you know? He was just, yeah, quite normal about it, really, quite blasé. He didn't seem to sort of be too worried. Tony's behaviour seemed strange and in marked contrast to his brother Danny's. 
you know, Danny started ringing pe around people, really getting involved in what was going on. But Tony wasn't, Tony was just sitting in the house. I won't stay in the house, he kept saying to Danny, in case he turns back up again. On Saturday afternoon, a decision was made that Gemma needed reporting missing. So Tony went along with his brother Danny and then a very close friend of Gemma's to report Gemma missing at the local police station. As the last person to see Gemma, police are keen to get Tony's version of events. But his response to a simple question about their last meeting proves suspicious. He provided three different answers and his brother became frustrated with him, thought that it was because he was high on cannabis and he couldn't remember what time he was meant to have seen her last. As well as reporting Gemma missing to the police, her friends contact the local newspaper for help. I was a reporter on the East London Advertiser. Uh, when a call happened to come in, um, it was a friend and cousin of Gemma McCloskey, who was looking for the papers, newspapers help in, in, in finding Gemma. And Cousin mentioned that she used to star in EastEnders. And obviously my ears sort of pricked up, that was something quite unusual. And I put together a headline along the lines, brothers and friends searching for missing EastEnders actress. She told me that they were putting a search party together. So ahead of the search party, I decided to put in a call to her two brothers. Tony seemed quite sort of calm and collected on the phone, really, maybe even a bit distant. He was very different to Danny, who came across much more emotional uh, and worried. Gemma has now been missing for four days, and her family, desperate for information, are doing everything they can to find her. Over the weekend, they got in contact with a lot of friends. So on the Monday night, we're going to go around Shoreditch and Bethel Green asking people did anyone see Gemma. But Tony never went to this thing. He said, I'll stay in the house in case there's any phone calls and she turns back up again. But when it actually started to happen, Tony all of a sudden turned up because he did, the Sun newspaper had come down there. So he, he made an appearance. Gemma's friends and family do their best to remain positive, despite the lack of news. However, they're beginning to face a growing realisation that something terrible has happened. This is not like her. Something's wrong. Like, in my stomach, something told me something was wrong. But I st obviously still wanted to keep the faith and thought she'll turn up, you know. Um, but, yeah, as the days went on, I think it just became more apparent to me and that crippling feeling in my stomach just made me even more aware that something bad had happened. Tuesday the 6th of March, around about 2.30pm, there's a lady that is navigating through Regent's Canal. She comes to Acton Lock. Um, she's filling the lock up with water and she bangs her barge into a suitcase. She looks over the side and the suitcase effectively pops open and then out comes a torso. The first time I started to really think something when the police come round here, uh, John Nicholson and um, uh, another guy, uh, a liaison officer, I said, well, why, why, do you, why do I need a liaison officer? And all of a sudden, it come up on the television they have found a body in the canal. As soon as I heard that, my stomach just went. I rung some of our friends and was like hysterical. And they were like, you know, don't worry about it. It's, it's probably not her, don't be so silly. There's no one on this planet that would do that to Gemma. She's such a lovely girl. We were shocked, the police were shocked. Oh, it was just a terrible, a terrible, t just that instant minute was terrible. Straight away, I thought, Tony's been involved in this. Tony had on at least one, if not two occasions, gone to Strangler. She must have been scared of him. Tell me what you know about the disappearance of Gemma. 
No comment. In March 2012, the Metropolitan Police were searching for missing 29-year-old actress Gemma McCluskey. A week after she disappeared, they made a gruesome discovery when a dismembered torso was found in a London canal. As forensic officers went about the grim task of identifying the remains, the press and public clamoured to find out more about the former EastEnders star. She was a great little character, Gemma. Great little character. Everyone loved her. I'd never heard anyone say a bad word about Gemma. She was uh, very carefree. And um, she squandered money like water. As soon as she got a penny a pound, out, it was gone. She bite, and she was a very generous person as well. Very, very generous. She used to buy all her friends stuff, kids. Uh, she loved children, she did, yeah. She was full of life. <laughs> she was um, a proper lab mouth. You would know when she was coming. She was full of it, proper full of it. Yeah, she was the life and soul of the party. She loved everyone. She would do anything she could to help anyone, even if she didn't know them. She would try her damned hardest to make their life better. Only days after the discovery of the torso in the canal, the police had reached an inevitable conclusion. Gemma had a very distinctive tattoo on her back, in the small of her back, which was of a bow and um, the people in the local community became aware very, very quickly that that's what we had discovered. And although officially we couldn't say that that was the case until we had compared DNA that we recovered from Gemma's toothbrush, we knew that that was Gemma's body. It wasn't long before Gemma's friends and family received the news that they had been dreading. And then the police told us that it was Gemma. Stephanie Gemma's body. <laughs> How has this happened to Gemma? Who could do this to her? I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that someone had done that to Gem. You know, that someone had murdered her, let alone what they did to her as well, and that they'd only found, found a part of her as well. She was incomplete. So I said, listen, I said, Gemma is not getting touched. She's not getting buried, cremated, nothing, until all of her body is together. And I kind of said, you tell Mr McCluskey, I will keep his daughter safe until um, so she's all together. And that, 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 that killed me, that did. It really did. As Gemma's loved ones begin to try and come to terms with their dreadful loss and the fact that only part of her body had been recovered, the relationship between Gemma and her brother, Tony, is coming under scrutiny. Gemma had made a little, a, quite a good little success in my life. She'd done a, quite a few television programmes and uh, she was getting noticed quite a lot. I think Tony was jealous of Gemma, how she was getting on with her life. You know, he didn't seem to have any self-esteem about himself. He was a very lonely boy. I mean, he really let himself go. You know, he was smelly, dirty. He used to come in from work at night time. Just going straight up the stairs, not even having a wash, and smoke and skunk all night long, smashed out of his head. Gemma wasn't happy, or his mum wasn't happy, at the amount of cannabis that he was smoking. And we found out that um, some days he was smoking between 15 and 20 joints. And this isn't a normal strength cannabis, this is skunk cannabis, which is, you know, a very strong strand. And that clearly affected him as a person. Skunk is really just the simple term for potent cannabis. So old-fashioned cannabis, traditional marijuana or hashish, had about 3 or 4% of THC, that's the active ingredient, whereas skunk has about 16%.
So you can think of it that old-fashioned cannabis is like lager and skunk is a bit like uh, the equivalent of vodka. So it's a powerful version of the same thing. One of the most noticeable effects of skunk is the way it can alter the user's behavior. Initially, people become suspicious of their friends. They have more quarrels with their, their friends and their relatives. Then they begin to wonder, are they really being as kind and helpful as they usually are? Is it possible that they've got something against them? Or could they have been gossiping with neighbors about them? Or could they actually be out to harm them or poison them? So eventually people can develop a picture that looks just like schizophrenia. They can hear voices uh, when there's nobody there and they can develop delusions, uh, strange ideas, uh, other people are ganging up against them or maybe even interfering with their brain. Friends of Gemma begin to recall that the arguments between her and her brother Tony had started to escalate, becoming both more frequent and more aggressive. When Gemma used to come and stay at mine, you know, she didn't have any clothes or anything. She'd just left the house and literally drove straight to mine. So, yeah, she must have been scared of him. And through their investigation, police find the problems had already been officially reported by Gemma and Tony's mum. Pauline had written to the local authority to say that Tony had become aggressive and he was having a go at her and having a go at his sister. Tony had at, um, at least one, if not two occasions, gone for Gemma and actually gone to strangle her, put, well, put his hands around her throat. Given the unusual nature of the case, police turned to specialist experts for clues as to who might be responsible for Gemma's death. Just after we'd recovered Gemma's torso, I got in touch with a clinical forensic psychologist called Adrian West. What he reported back was really significant. He said, homicides ending with corpse dismemberment is nearly always performed at the site of the homicide, generally in the place inhabited by the perpetrator, the victim, or shed by both. And finally, that homicides followed by dismemberment are most commonly committed by a person close to or at least acquainted with the victim. The next step for detectives is to try and determine Gemma's movements in what was to be the very last day of her life. Gemma's day started early in the morning, being awoken by uh, the sound of running water. She went into the bathroom and the taps were overflowing. It was obvious to her that that was her brother. She went and woke her brother up and she had a go at him for what he did. They had an argument. Gemma then got ready and went to the Royal London Hospital in the Whitechapel Road. Gemma had offered to film the opening ceremony of this new hospital wing as one of her friend's daughters was appearing in the performance. And then following that, she went to her friend's house and she was there for um, sort of half an hour, 45 minutes. She received a telephone call from Tony. And during that conversation, um, they had another falling out. Gemma explaining quite um, in strong terms, you know, how disappointed she was with him. And one of her friends talked about that they could hear um, the man on the other end of the phone, not knowing it was her brother at that time, but that they were aggressive and shouting at her down the phone. So there was clearly a further agitation. So later on that afternoon, 1.17, she then left the house and she started to make her way back home. Gemma then made a couple of telephone calls to Tony, and we know that because we had a look at Gemma's telephone records. Um, those calls didn't connect, but at 1.47, there was a very brief telephone conversation that lasted eight seconds between the two of them. Um, and at 1.50, we got CCTV of Gemma's car arriving back at Pelter Street. What we do know, that by eight minutes past two, Gemma's phone was no longer hitting the local mast. So her phone was switched off effectively from that time. And what we suspect is that between those times, Gemma had died. 
As the last person to have seen Gemma alive, coupled with his unusual responses to questions when his sister was reported missing, police are keen to talk to Tony again. We had treated Tony initially as a significant witness. He wasn't under caution. He wasn't suspected of involvement in Gemma's murder at that time. And he gave us a free-flowing account of what he said had happened that day. Um, what, what were you thinking? Well, I was just starting to get my own thought, well, well, where was she, you know what I mean? And during that interview, there were issues that arose where he couldn't quite answer or was reluctant or needed time to think about things. What was the, the last time you remember actually seeing her? It was between half two and three o'clock. And there were a number of inconsistencies, things he'd said at the police station when he reported Gemma missing, being the last person to see her alive. It was just in a round, we got a feeling that he was potentially responsible for her death. With the police investigation focusing ever more on Tony, detectives arrest him and interview him again. This time, he chooses to say nothing. Tell me about what you know about the disappearance of Gemma. No comment. Surely you want to bring to justice the people responsible. No comment. In law, you, you don't have to speak to the police and Tony affected that right. That was really bizarre, so much as that is Tony's right, his sister had on the face of it been abducted, murdered, dismembered, yet Tony, her, one of her closest family members, would, was choosing to say nothing about it. And that really was significant for us in the investigation because that really made us feel as if you know, he must have had something to do with her death. Tony, did you kill Gemma? No comment. It is certainly the most grisly story I've ever covered as a, as a reporter. As we pulled the package out, you could see her paint the fingernails. I said to him, listen, Tony, you just got to tell me the truth. What actually happened that day? Police investigating the murder of actress Gemma McCluskey have arrested her brother, Tony, on suspicion of being involved in his sister's death. As he's questioned by the police, a search of his phone records reveals a series of messages. Messages sent the day after Gemma went missing. Tony acted as if nothing untoward had happened. He texted his girlfriend, apologised for not being in touch the night before. And then at 10.31, he went to see his mother in hospital in central London. At 4.51, he sent Gemma another text which said, Gem, ring me when you get this message. What are you having for dinner? Are you working tonight? Kiss, kiss. And then the police make perhaps the most crucial discovery yet. That evening is when we know that Tony had made an inquiry with the local minicab firm. The record showed that the guy had given the name as Tom. And that minicab firm is about a two or three minute walk from Pelter Street from where he lived. And of course, we followed that line of inquiry. As it happened on the day that the officer went in, the same controller and the same cab driver had, that had been there on the night were actually there. And they both recall Tom having a bag and um, that it, would, it was a weighty bag. And the minicab driver's vehicle was around the back of the cab office. And we have CCTV footage, which was absolutely crucial to the investigation, where we see Tony struggling with a heavy object and placing it into the boot of the car. And once we've tested the vehicle, we find Gemma's blood, and that was hugely significant for us. He told the minicab driver to take him to Dunstan Road, which is where the Regent's Canal is. The cab driver gave an account of Tony struggling to get the bag out of the car, and then off Tony went towards Acton Lock. 
There was a student who was out on her balcony that overlooked the canal, and she recalled seeing a man dragging a bag along the canal. Was charged on Saturday with her murder as divers continued to search for evidence in the Regent's Canal. He has been for the McCluskey family, it's almost impossible to believe that their son could be responsible for Gemma's death. So lead detective John Nicholson makes a bold decision to show the family the CCTV footage of Tony struggling with the suitcase. Mr. Nicholson came round and he showed me a video of a, a guy coming round the corner pulling a big suitcase. I said, that is 100% Tony dragging that bag. As the weight of suspicion grows, Tony finally gives his version of events to his own father. I said to him, listen, Tony, you've just got to tell me the truth, what actually happened that day in the house. And he said, well, Dad came in the house ranting and raving, screaming at me, I want you out of this house. Mum wants you out the house. We don't want you in here no more. He said, what actually happened? He said, well, I was up the stairs. And when she got to the top of the stairs, she had a knife in her hand. And I thought, a knife? There's no way Gemma would use a knife. What happened behind closed doors, we really don't know. There are only two people that can give that story, one of whom is dead and the other one has refused steadfastly since that time to provide us with an account. Tell me about what you know about the disappearance of Gemma. No comment. At the time we charged Tony, we had very little, in real terms, of hard evidence. One of the most surprising parts of the investigation is what police discover when they carry out a detailed forensic search of the house where Gemma and Tony were living. They find virtually nothing. We would have expected to have found the flat awash with blood or blood spatter at walls. And the kind of treatments that we used to highlight that would, would show that even if that had been cleaned down. On this occasion, that wasn't the case. We have a look in the plug holes we test in and around the bath, the walls of the bathroom, and other areas like that within the house. If somebody's cleared up blood, we see smear marks, but we didn't find that in these circumstances. And in fact, the scientist that went into the flat was um, pretty certain that it hadn't happened there. That in itself was really unusual. There were two or three blood spots found within the bathroom. There was some blood found on a kitchen knife, which was in the block in the kitchen. Unfortunately, this blood evidence wasn't proof that Gemma had come to harm in the flat. After all, she may have simply cut herself on a knife and tried to clean herself up. However, another find made police more suspicious. There was a minute particle of body matter, so matter that had come from within Gemma's body was found on a cabinet within the bathroom. That one small particle of matter was hugely significant. Because he didn't speak to us, we don't know what's happened. What I guess is that he has gone out and bought, you know, gloves, overalls, a significant amount of material where he's covered Gemma's body and then he's gone about dismembering her and then has done a really good clear up around it. I, I can't think that it's anything other than that. He went out on the Friday morning and went and bought bin bags and hold holds and got himself a newspaper and a pack of the bags. And when you see the video, it just seems to have a care in the world. How callous is that, you know what I mean? His own sister, and he hasn't got a care in the world. As the investigation continues, 
detectives are more than aware that only Gemma's torso has been recovered. They make every effort possible to try and find the rest of her body, both for the sake of her family and to find vital clues as to the cause of her death. The Metropolitan Police Underwater Search Unit, they were doing a methodical search, fingertip search of the canal bed. We also had an offer from the local waterways authority. They were looking at inlets and behind barges, doing their normal uh, work, but were keeping an eye out for the things that we were looking for. It suddenly occurred to us that the family weren't going to be able to lay to rest and go through the grieving process until all of her had been found. Um, so it became a real mission, basically. We were the ones that found the packages of her body parts. You don't often see bags of rubbish in the canal that are wrapped in these heavy-duty bin liners. It was a, a very distinctive sort of wrapping. The majority of the packages we found were completely solidly wrapped. There was nothing showing. It was just you know, sort of a vague arm or leg shape. Um, the last one was the one that, that really brought it home, uh, the, the, that this was a human being. Um, oh, God. Yeah, um, it was a, as we pulled the package out, um, you could see her fingers, um, painted fingernails. And as we pulled it out, the the end of the the, the package had come out, um, and you could see the, the butchered flesh. What the most likely thing that had happened, Tony had thrown them in. They'd been weighted down, but then the the gas that had given off from the the decomposition of the body part had then raised the bag to the surface. Whilst the majority of Gemma's remains are thankfully recovered within a matter of days of each other, tragically, it would be months before her head was located. The local community were clearing out a place called Kingsland Basin, and the person that found the park, he'd hooked out this bag, which was quite heavy, kind of left it on the side to drain, and then had opened the, the, the bag and discovered Gemma's head, severed head there. That was a particularly gruesome discovery, but also, I guess, some sort of relief for, for, for the family, because they didn't want to bury Gemma or put her to rest till they had all of her. That killed me, that did. It really did. I mean, the head, it was a two mile further up the canal. The police told us to meet the, 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 the guys that was doing the search in, in the canal, and the guys were absolutely amazing. Everything they'd done, where they searched, really, really fantastic people who were. They were amazing people. Once we had Gemma's head, the pathologist was able to analyse that she had been hit by what he described as blunt force trauma, something like an ashtray or a heavy object to her head on at least two occasions. She would have died as a result of a bleed on the brain. I can't make no sense of it. I remember at the time, I'd said to Tony, when you done that to Gemma, why didn't you just phone me? Phone me and tell me. And I'd have come straight over. And we'd get a hold of the police, tell them what's happened. But no, you, you never, you know, look what you've done to her. You murdered your own sister, cut her up into pieces. I just had to walk out the court. It's inconceivable that he couldn't recall those things. There's no way you don't remember that.
On the 14th of January 2013, the family and friends of Gemma McCluskey gathered at the Old Bailey. In the dock, charged with her murder, was her own brother, Tony. His story in court was that he couldn't remember. For me, that's inconceivable that he couldn't recall those things, particularly when he did have it about him to construct text messages that were lies. It's one thing accidentally hurting someone. It's another thing what he did. You murdered your own sister, and then he cut her up into pieces, and then he disposed of her in the local canal. You know, he went to the shop to go and get the stuff to do that. He got a cab to the canal. He dumped her body in the canal. There's no way you don't remember that. The hardest part of the trial was when he got this forensic expert on how the body had been cut up. She'd been gone for about five minutes and it, oh, I couldn't handle it no more. The detail was terrible. It really done my head in. I just got up and had to walk out to court. She was able to give us a professional opinion about what had happened in terms of dismemberment. What we do know is that Tony, having killed Gemma, dismembered her body in the flat itself. What we did establish that during the dismemberment, Tony became more proficient in what he did. So initially, he used a knife to try and remove Gemma's limbs, and that was unsuccessful. And so he then went on to using as an ax kind of implement. And during that time, he got better. So the first limb that he dismembered took him um, in the region of 20 to 25 attempts. And then as he went forward, those number of attempts reduced, and this would take probably two to three hours. Throughout the trial, Tony maintains his claim that he can't remember killing his sister or what happened afterwards. Tony was making himself look at such a fool. He really was. He was making himself look such a fool. This guy that was on about uh, amnesia, this expert, um, Dismissed that claim straight, straight off. The jury don't believe Tony's claims of amnesia either. They find him guilty of murder, and he's sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 20 years, leaving only speculation as to what really happened. I suspect what's happened is he has, in a fit of rage, hit Gemma, and then once he has killed her, what does he do? He's got an option, hasn't he, to call the police, to call some family and friends and to say, I've made a terrible mistake, this is what's happened. But he chose not to do that. He chose to get rid of Gemma's body and he chose to dismember, which is, you know, a horrific, horrendous thing for him to do. I personally think it was premeditated, the way that this was carried out. I don't think it's some like it's something that someone would do irrationally. How did he know how to clean the property to that level? You know, he knew what he was doing. What has gone on in the background? You know, the tensions that are perhaps built up to that. That's probably you know part of the reason that we we got to that position. But Gemma was a strong character, as we know, and Tony in himself was, you know, using cannabis on a regular basis. And probably the truth around why he did it lies somewhere, that, somewhere within those lines. There's no sense to be made of a brother killing his sister, you know, over something trivial like that. There's no sense to be made of it at all. What he did after and how he lied to everyone and how he deceived us all. I spoke to him every single day and he'd tell me she'd be OK. How could you say that? You should have just said nothing. How can you say that when you know what you did to her? I hate him. I will never, ever forgive him. I will always hate him. That hate is, is deep down inside of me. Oh, there's, no, there's nothing, absolutely nothing but hate. 
It is certainly the most grisly story, the most gruesome story I've ever covered as a, as a reporter. On a busy news patch in the east end of London, I had covered my fair share of stabbings, um, even shootings, I think. Um, certainly very serious road fatalities, uh, but, but never anything like this. So the fact that Tony's never owned up that he has any recollection of doing what he did is a real challenge, I think, for his father, but also his brother. It won't change anything as far as they're concerned. Gemma is gone. Um, she met a violent death by him. But for him as an individual, um, that's something he has to live with. Wouldn't it be great for the family to hear that he was sorry for doing what he did, the fact that he's done it, and to be able to explain to them what actually and truly happened. Despite the fact that the family never get that admission, Anthony makes the brave decision to support Tony in prison. I said right at the start I would stand by him, and I really did mean that. I really did mean it, because I was going to lose two children, not one. I was going to lose Gemma and then Tony to a long time in prison. And I said to everyone, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand by Tony. My sister came over with Jay, she said, why are you saying that? How can you stand by him? I said, it was me flesh and blood. I've got to stand by him. Tony writes countless letters to his father from prison, all the time maintaining he's been suffering from amnesia. as I'm still finding it very hard to believe myself that I could do such a terrible thing. Anyway, Dad, I wish I could tell you more about what happened. And I'm still sitting here at night and day thinking, now I stop to remember, trying to put the, press, the pieces together. But I just can't remember what happened that day. I've done for me, Dad, and I will look forward to seeing you soon. I love you so much. Be lucky, yours loving son, Tony. Every letter was the same. He's not shown no remorse, not an ounce of remorse. He doesn't mention their name. I'm trying to support him and look after him. But he's not showing no remorse, not a, and that was it. I just in the end, I went, I've had enough, Tony. On that last visit, I said, I've had enough of you. I said, I'm gone. I'm out of your life now. But don't get me wrong, I still do think about him. But I haven't had no contact with him now for over two years. And I won't contact him again. Gemma's mother, Pauline, passed away in 2013, still struggling to come to terms with what her son had done. For Gemma's remaining family and friends, all that's left is the slow process of dealing with their terrible loss. I miss her more than life itself. I miss her every single day. My girls miss her too. Um, just miss her voice. I sit and watch old YouTube videos of when she was on EastEnders just so that I can hear her voice. It's impossible not to miss her. I've lost two children, haven't I? I've lost Gemma, the love of my life. I'm my eldest son, Tony, my firstborn. And I miss my Gemma. I really do. It breaks my heart. A <laughs> poor girl's lying in a, in a grave. 29 years old and dead. What a waste of a life, what a waste. A good person she was. And an evil person killed her. <laughs>